Welcome to People Doing Good for Others. Welcome to People Doing Good for Others where we celebrate and honor and hold in the light those who truly make significant contributions in our communities. I'm Gary York, and I'm grateful to be with you. I want to thank Wilkes Communications, River Street Productions, and 100.9 WIFM for this opportunity. Our featured guest today is Jeffrey Elmore. He's a significant contributor in the Yadkin Valley and particularly in Wilkes County. He's a native here. He's also a professional educator and he's a North Carolina House of Representative person from the 94th District. Uh, Jeffrey Elmore is a, a true community servant and a person who has a servant's heart. And thank you again for being with us. And good morning to you, my friend. Good morning, Gary. And it's an honor to have uh, a person with uh, dual careers, if you will, or maybe even more than that as a family and a community man. So, uh, Jeffrey Elmore, tell us about your uh, decision to be in public service. Okay. Um, I, I've started, um, I guess, my political outreach or uh, with the town board in North Wilkesboro. Uh, that's where I first got involved. And the town at that time, this was in 2007, it, it was um, going through a lot of transition. I, I think there was a lot of, in my opinion, negativity at that time. And I, um, as a younger person, I had a, uh, was, I hadn't been married too long at that time, a younger person in the community. I, I felt like hey, it doesn't have to be this way. Can we make some sort of change? And uh, I talked with some folks and said, uh, I'm thinking about running for town board. And they said, well, you'll either come in first or you'll come in last. <laughs> <laughs> so that's kind of how it started. And um, I put my name on the ballot and I talked with people and um, I, I was elected. And um, it, it started something that I never really thought I would be there. Uh, you know, I never thought about going into politics. That was not anything that I really aspired to. But I, I, I realized that the system, the, the system we have, that um, if you're going to make a difference, you've got to try and, and you've got to uh, put an effort to it. And, that, and that's how it started. And um, it, it's been an interesting ride ever since. The spectator is not involved. That's you right. either have to get in, in, the, in it and be a part of it. Or, That's right. Uh, so thank you very much. And uh, I want to talk about your role as an educator sure. and emphasis on going to college and getting a degree sure. and some of those things about home, if you will. Sure, yeah. Um, I've taught for, uh, let's see, 2020, will, this will be the start of my 20th year. Uh, I've taught in the public schools um, the entire time. I had uh, one year in Winston-Salem Forsyth at what they called an Equity Plus school, which was an at-risk school. And the rest have been uh, here in Wilkes, uh, where I've been fortunate because what I teach, I teach art, like you mentioned in the um, intro, and uh, I've gotten to teach all grade levels. So I've taught uh, kids from kindergarten all the way up to seniors in high school. And um, getting into that, I was a teaching fellow and uh, how I got involved with that. Um, guidance counselor, I was talking with him in high school, and he, um, I had an open slot, and he uh, scheduled me to help with one of the exceptional children's classes with their math. So I was basically like in a pseudo tutoring role. And after doing that, I, I realized this is something I would like to do. And so I applied for the Teaching Fellow Scholarship and um, went to Appalachian. Um, and got my degree and uh, went into the classroom. So it, it's uh, the school system has been good to me, and um, I, I'm very proud of the school system that we have here in Wilkes. Me too. Uh, in, in the 94th district, both Alexander and Wilkes, we have two very good um, school systems. 
uh, in my district that uh, we should be very proud of, especially now that I'm at the state level and I see um, how some of the other systems function across the state. We're really blessed in our area with our schools. I uh, have interviewed Mark Bird yes, several sir. times. And yes, uh, as I prepare each morning to leave my home, I, I revisit those CDs. And he was talking about three months ago about the challenges here locally, but we're in good hands. Yes. With our school board, our administrators, uh, Wilkes County is uh, fortunate to have great people who care. Oh yes, very much so. And um, e education is important, and especially as um, time moves on, technology changes, the economy changes. You know, the role of education and training uh, for our young people is more critical than ever uh, on them having the skills that they need um, to be able to have careers uh, after they get out. Jeffrey Elmore, go back to being a teaching fellow, and yeah. I'm glad to learn that. I didn't yeah, know that. Yeah. And that's, I'm one of the biggest fans of that program. Yes. Uh, for years served in Surrey County on the, the screening committee. Yes. So uh, those enrichments about to say uh, I'm a teaching fellow, uh -huh. that must be, when you said that, I'm saying, wow. Yeah. That's a quite an impressive program. Oh, it, it is, and we've the program has changed over time. Um, uh, when I went through the program, it was uh, more open on if, according to what you wanted to teach, you had to tell them in the beginning. You know, I'm interested in teaching high school math, or or I'm going into elementary ed, and because of the uh, workforce needs that we have, it's now a more specific program where we're looking for STEM teachers. Um, math teachers and exceptional children teachers because those areas are very hard to fill in the school system. And something exciting that we got done in this short session is we expanded it to more schools. So now there's eight universities that are participating in the current program. So it, it's still a very good opportunity for folks who are interested in going into teaching. And I, I, I used to joke, I said uh, I was an indentured servant to the state because the deal sure. is they, oh, they yeah. give you the money sure and uh, you agreed to teach four years. And, you know, when I first went into it, I'll, I'll be very honest, you, you know, you think I'm gonna do the four years and then I'm gonna possibly do something else. But once you get started in the classroom with the background that they put you through, um, you, you realize that's the place that you needed to be. And there was no question that uh, when my indentured servant part was up, <laughs> that, that this was the place that I wanted to be. When you uh, speak of being a professional educator and it's in art. Yes. And tell us a little bit about how, what drew you there. Well, it, it was um, teachers that I had and, and the classes that I took. Um, I, I guess really it hit me more in middle school uh, when I um, went into the art classroom. The classroom was very different than all the other classes. Uh, meaning you were not in the road desk, uh, you're sitting at tables, it, the room was um, messy, uh, it seemed kind of chaotic, it's like, is this really a classroom? And uh, going through that experience and that different way of thinking, because uh, I think what's valuable with the art class and why it's so important, it's not really about just creating something, it, it's about critical thinking to, for... Critical thinking. Yes, very oh. much so. Uh, it, looking for solutions to a problem when there's no clear defined answer. And I think so much in life, there are no clear and defined answers when you face a lot of things. You've got to figure out how to solve the problem with maybe uh, no context to it. You've got to be creative in that problem solving solution. So I, I think having the arts and being ex at least exposed to it. That's very important for every kid. And uh, something I worked on this session, but, and this piece of legislation had been floating for, uh, strong for about 12 years and it never could pass, is we're gonna be implementing an arts graduation requirement where the kids across the state of North Carolina, uh, and how it reads is from sixth grade to 12th grade, they are at least offered one arts course. Now that's not specific to visual art, it could be music, it could be chorus, but they have to at least have one course in that. And 
And Good. I think that's very important I do too. to help with this job training that I mentioned earlier uh, for those critical thinking and creative thinking skills because that's the competitive edge that the United States has uh, is our innovation. And we've got to foster mm. that. Wow. Jeffrey, when uh, then we transitioned from being a board member at North Wilkesboro, did you go straight into the to the state uh, leadership then? Um, I served um, a term and a half um, on the town board and um, Shirley Randleman held this seat uh, and she was retiring. Um, I thought about it. I didn't know if I really wanted to do it. Uh, some folks talked to me about it. I knew working in the schools that I always felt like that we were being held back a lot of times because of the bureaucracy that came out of Raleigh. Um, and I said, hey, I, I've done this before with the town board, uh, wanted to get involved to make a change. And I said, I I'll try it. I I'll put my name in the hat because I, I think that um, locally, teachers, education system, folks know what the needs are locally. And I wanted to take that philosophy to Raleigh to try to make a difference. And um, that's how that started. That's how that happened. Yeah. Wow. Jeffrey L. Moore is our state representative in the 94th district, also an art teacher in the Wilkes County Schools. Tell me about your family. Um, grew up here. Um, uh, as a matter of fact, from the studio here, I grew up in Westwood Hills. <laughs> so literally just probably a quarter of a mile from here. Uh, product of the school system here. Um, um, fortunate, uh, both my parents are still with me and uh, very involved. I have uh, twin sons, uh, Carter and Campbell, and uh, have stepdaughter Katie, and uh, live in North Wilkesboro with my wife Laura. So Laura, mm -hmm. thank you very much. Uh, I wanted to make sure today that we talk about short session, long session. Sure. And as you go to Raleigh, and uh, would you walk through that for me? Sure. Um, how it works in the state, and a lot of people um, don't uh, understand this, we, we create what's called a biennium budget, which is technically a budget that lasts for two years. So it's okay. not an annual budget. So uh, what happens, um, this November will be the next election. And what will happen this coming year, 2021, will be what's called long session. Long session. And that's where the current budget is technically... Uh, not in place anymore and a new budget has to be formulated. So it starts in January and it's supposed to end at the beginning of the fiscal year, which is uh, July 1. Okay. So all those budget discussions are talked about during that time period. Also, it's when new legislation can be proposed. So if you have a new idea for a law, that is when you file the bill and to try to move it through the process. So then in the next year is what's considered short session. And what short session consists of is um, looking at any bills that had passed at least one chamber, so from the House to the Senate or from the Senate to the House, uh, they're, they're considered still alive, uh, and also to make any budget adjustments. So it's not really formulating a new budget in the short session, but it is making tweaks to the current budget. It's been very different the past few years in Raleigh with long session, short session, because it's blended together so much because of reactions we've had to make to, uh, we've had two hurricanes that have come through that we had to create relief packages. Uh, we had wildfires that popped up in the western part of the state that we had to react to. And also with COVID-19 currently, uh, we had to come in and deal with um, funding mechanisms in reaction to that. So a lot of the long session, short session has blended together in the past couple of years because of some of the um, unforeseen things um, that the states faced. Jeffrey Elmore, if you were just <clears throat> making an assumption, say you're in session, sure. will you go on Sunday or Monday morning or give us a, kind of a schedule and how things work for you as the representative of uh, District 94. Yeah, um, in uh, typical, when we're in full blast, 
Uh, I usually have to arrive in Raleigh about mid-afternoon on Mondays. Okay. Uh, we can have session uh, on Monday nights. Uh, they usually start at about seven if they're votes. Uh, then you will have committee meetings that um, happen on Tuesdays and Wednesdays, uh, and votes happen in the afternoon. Uh, those days can be rather long between the committee meetings and the voting, and then uh, dealing with constituent matters, things of that nature. I usually get in the office about 7.30 in the morning, and I don't leave till about 8.30 at night. Uh, that's about a typical time and sometimes they can be longer. Um, just coming out of short session, we had um, had to wrap up, and that ran till 3 a.m. Uh, with wow. voting uh, to get all of the things through so we could uh, leave. So that process normally happens through um, Thursday, and then on Fridays, they try to leave open, and what I do is that's when I do um, constituent-type things. So if the, you're still in Raleigh, no, on, Friday, the, come, on Fridays I come home. home. Okay, but this is when I would schedule like a meeting with the mayor, or um, let's say I needed to tour a farm or something of that nature. So that's oh. what I would deal with on the Fridays. So you do farming? No, no, I, I, mean, I, I, I don't would do. Would you farming. say you would visit one? Oh, sure. I'm on the agriculture committee. Are you? Yeah. Tell us about that. Sure. Um, I. I on the education committees, but a very important committee that I'm on is the agriculture committee. And I feel like representing the counties that I represent, that's really important because we have a very diverse agriculture community in both of the counties uh, between poultry, beef production, our wineries, uh, orchards, uh, and the timber industry. We have one of the most- Timber. Timber, yeah. I hadn't thought of that. Yeah. Wow. yeah, one of the most diverse agriculture economies in the state of North Carolina. So that's a very important committee that I'm on. And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, let's see, last week, I went on a tour of Stevens Sausage Factory. This, they're called a further processor. And they make hot dogs and uh, red hots and sausages and things. And uh, we were talking with them about the effects that COVID-19 has had on their business because their business model has changed because there's so much um, sales in the grocery store now. Um, so it, 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 that's a very important uh, committee that I'm on, and it very much directly affects the district because our biggest economic producer in this district is agriculture. It, uh, and people kind of really don't think that because they think, well, jobs are really struggling here, and they're looking at the retail stores, et cetera, but the biggest economic driver we have here is our agriculture sector. Uh, Jeffrey Elmore, you, uh, did you go to Raleigh knowing about the, the your interest in agriculture or is it something uh, no i i mean I, I have very little exposure to ag i i will admit it you know i used to maintain a, a garden and my dad growing up uh the my grandfather maintained a, a, what i would call like a household farm you, you know they had chickens and pigs and that sort of thing but nothing like what we see today and uh, I really wanted to be on that committee because of our economy here. Agriculture really affects a lot of people in this community. It's very important, and I just wanted to be on that committee to where we had a voice for things that go on in this area of the state, because a lot of times the focus on ag is always in the eastern part of the state. Oh, They okay. focus on that, and they forget that we have a large agriculture sector in the western part of the state. It may be different than what's in the eastern part, but it's just as important. So I, I, um, I feel like that's a very important committee that I'm fortunate to be on. Uh, Brenda Blake with the Blake yes. uh, test. They have 24 chicken houses. I mean, oh, yes. so that's a, uh, you're a, a person who would listen to the concerns of the Blake family. Oh, very much so. And um, what we're seeing now, the pressure on uh, even farms that are that large is that they're having to diversify because some sectors of the farm could be uh, losing money or struggling and to make up for those um, losses you have to offset with something else and uh, they're an excellent farm to look at because they've diversified uh, with the greenhouse business yes. uh, selling yes. plants and things uh, Wow! so when the economic ups and downs of the poultry is there uh, they have, uh, they've diversified themselves. And that's happening all over the state. Um, and I think that's really important. Um, something I worked on this short session 
was um, I helped uh, do the legislation. I actually filed the legislation and got it passed uh, for uh, meat processing. These are your small meat processors that yeah. are uh, slaughter cows, uh, beef primarily, but some do pork um, and other animals for the small farmer. Uh, right now in these economic times, uh, folks are having to sell off part of their herd, you know, take one or two cows to be able to process to uh, cash out because they need the cash flow. These processors have been so backed up because of COVID-19 that a farmer that needs a couple of cows processed, uh, they're giving them dates. We can't get to it till February 2021 or March really? 2021. So what this grant program will do is um, they can apply for it to get uh, workforce training to bring in more workers and train them uh, and also equipment grants. So if they needed a, uh, like a slicing machine or something of that nature that could increase their productivity, um, that they could apply for this grant. And, and that was a big deal. Uh, it's a $10 million grant program running through the Department of Ag, but we feel like that when we infuse that money, it can help these processors with their backlog, thus helping the small farmer that's uh, needing some of their herd processed to help oh, them in goodness. these economic times. So it, it's fascinating. Is it time for us to talk about COVID-19? Sure. Just sure. The, the impact of financial stability of the state and some of those things, if you will. Sure. Um, uh, COVID, I think, has uh, blindsided everything and the, and the um, reaction to COVID. Um, some are arguing it's good. Some are arguing that it's bad. I, I do know that uh, I personally feel like COVID is something that we need to worry about. But at the same time, we've got to um, live our lives, too. We. Um, it, it's sad we've had committee meetings uh, where uh, I'll just use the bowling alleys as an example. It was an owner of a bowling alley and it had been shut down and she was in literal tears. She said, I've I mortgaged my house uh, to keep this going. And if we don't open up, I've lost everything. And when you see stories like that, it's it's really had an effect on people. Not So just, that person that actually came into your meeting room and testify? Yes, in, in the committee that was dealing with that. And it, it's it's sad when you see that, Gary. And um, the effects of it, I think, will be felt not just in the immediate and, and the health effects with it too, but this is going to be something that I think it, it will be hard to get uh, going back again. Um, financially for the state, uh, we're anticipating a possible $4 billion shortfall and that's out of a $22 billion budget. So uh, it's a lot of revenue that we think can be lost. But we're seeing, oddly, people's buying patterns are changing uh, because we're seeing growth in some sectors, but major losses in others. So will all of that balance out? We, we really don't know. Um, but I'm, I'm hoping that with COVID, that we can get over the hump to where we can get back to where uh, the economy's at full force. Uh, because North Carolina, we're one of the fastest growing states in the country. Right, right. Uh, we had one of the strongest economies in the country. A lot of the metrics were showing that we were the best place for business. Uh, but even in the bad economic times, we're still seeing growth across the state uh, with jobs. Even in bad times? Even now, uh, you're still wow. seeing because the economy was roaring so hard um, prior to COVID-19. So I think we can get over the hump. It's just once all of the curve is flattened that uh, we can get going again. Jeffrey Elmore, uh, share your district, uh, towns, communities, and just a little bit of things that people might not know that live here, but might not know. Just sure, the, sure. About the, the 94th district. Yeah, I have all of Alexander County, uh, which is Taylorsville. Uh, the northern part, you have the orchards. Um, the uh, south, let me see, western part, you've got, a, it lies on Lake Hickory. So you have the community of Bethlehem. Uh, so you have uh, homes that are on the lake there. Uh, then on the um, eastern side, uh, going towards Statesville, you have the communities of Hidnight, which have the gym mines and there's a very nice uh, recreational park called Rocky Face down there where folks, um, it's an old quarry at one time and they've developed hiking trails and climbing. It's absolutely gorgeous. It's a neat place to visit. 
And then you get in the Wilkes part, I, I basically represent all of the population areas of Wilkes. So I have the uh, two towns here in the middle, uh, and then the district runs um, to, I call them the suburbs of Elkin, uh, Pleasant Hill area yeah, and yeah, Thurman and State sure. Road. I represent that area and that's very densely populated. So pretty much I have all of the population of Wilkes, um, but I do not have the whole county. The rest of it is in uh, District 90. Okay. You spoke of the Education Committee. Uh, share with us, how do you get in a committee? How do you become part of, or do you, is it an interest you have and let people, how does that work? Um, the Speaker of the House determines what committees that you're on, and uh, I'll compliment uh, Speaker Moore, uh, Speaker T uh, Tim Moore. He is out of Kings Mountain, Cleveland County. Uh, he has tried to match members not only with their interest, but also with their background. Oh. So I'm, I'm very fortunate. I'm the only public school teacher in the entire General Assembly. You are? Yes, yeah. There are some that are retired principals, uh, but there are uh, none that are practicing teachers that are um, still working. So with that background and my interest level, I chair um, education appropriations on the House side and also education K-12 policy, and I sit on uh, ed, uh, the uh, community college committee also. Community college. So um, uh. with my background, uh, they really, uh, the speaker feels like it's important to have somebody with on ground experience that is seeing what the policies are doing um, when they're enacted and have that voice on those committees. And it makes a big difference because um, it's very different at that level when it's put into law or policy and then as it filters down the chain, what it actually looks like in implementation it, it is usually very different. <laughs> <laughs> so I get to see both sides of the spectrum and, and it's a unique perspective that I'm fortunate to be in the place that I am down there to have that uh, when I'm talking with my colleagues. Wow. Well, uh, what are the most challenging for you as uh, an individual? Uh, give us some, some things that we might not know. Well, I, I, I think people need to realize that um, Number one, politics is not real glamorous. I love when people <laughs> are saying, you know, oh, the fat cats in Raleigh or whatever. It, it, it's, uh, I mean, I, I eat through the drive through in my car a whole lot. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I stay with a family down there. Uh, I stay in Clayton, so I have to drive in every day. It, you know, it's, it's not uh, this glamorous thing where you're eating steak dinners every night and that sort of thing. It, it's the exact opposite of that. But I, I think folks need to remember that these legislators, uh, they're people. And just like any group of people that you put together, I've met some of the best people I've ever met in my life. But then I've met some of the most horrible people I've ever met in my <laughs> life too. Uh, just like if you put a group of people together anywhere, yeah. you would see those same things. Uh, they're, they're human beings. And they, um, so you see the good of it and you see the bad of it yeah. in, in people. So it's, um, that, that's the most interesting part. And okay. it, it's about communication. You, you know, how do you communicate with folks and talk with folks to get your message across? We have a couple minutes left. Uh, yeah. Tell us about how folks can connect with you, Jeffrey or more about uh, concerns, if they want to see you, if they want to call sure. you. Tell us about how we get how we connect with Jeffrey Elmore. Well, as I said, communication is very important. Um, you can contact the office. Uh, my LA, I have a new LA. Uh, her name is Sarah Bush. Uh, my uh, other LA, she retired. She wanted to take care of grandbabies, and I don't blame her for that. And uh, Sarah is um, excellent, uh, and she is a um, good person to talk to. Uh, she can talk with you and help you with constituent issues, which that's probably the most important part of my job uh, from that perspective. Uh, email, uh, calls, letters. Um, also, my uh, website, I, uh, it's uh, jeffreyelmore.com. Uh, that's a way that you can communicate, message me through that. Uh, I try to stay active on uh, Facebook uh, with Jeffrey Elmore for NC House. Uh, you know, in this day of communication, you try to use as many platforms as you can to allow people to communicate their ideas or their concerns. 
Um, but constituent services is probably the, it is the most important jo uh, job that I have. Okay. It's helping people when they don't know where else to go. Yeah. So you want to make sure people understand your door is open. Yes. You want to be the person that they turn to. Yes, yes. Okay. And, and, and I don't have the answers. We usually rarely have the answers. But we have uh, the benefit of the office is that we can point you in the right direction. We can at least get you some sort of answer or connect you with the person that you need to if you're having problems with uh, what you need from the state government. And that, that, that's critical. We, we've helped a lot of people. And when you hear some of these circumstances that folks are in, it, it's sad, Gary. Yeah. And they don't know that they've been denied or they've been told this, told that. They've called eight different departments, eight different people, gotten eight different answers, and they really don't know what to do. And, and uh, that, that's, uh, that keeps you going with it. What a blessing to have you with us today. And uh, you're always available. Yes. And you're visible and you're a person that, uh, you know, I didn't have to call 10 times to get you to you <laughs> come here today. No, I, I was happy to come and uh, talk with you. I, I always enjoy talking with you. Uh, I f feel very honored that um, y you asked me to come. Uh, yeah. with, with We're honored to have you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for being with us today. And I'm Gary York. This is People Doing Good for Others. We want to thank Wilkes Communications and River Street Productions for this opportunity. And our featured guest has been Representative Jeffrey Elmore, District 94 of North Carolina State House. He represents Alexander and Wilkes County, and he's an honorable person who has a servant's heart, and he's blessed us today in countless ways. Until we can be together again, be safe and make sure that we take every opportunity to make a difference in the lives of others. Thank you. Bye-bye.